You're listening to RNIB's Insight Radio with Simon Pauly, and we're at TechShare Europe 2015 at the Glasgow Science Centre on Pacific Quay on the shores of the Clyde. Smart glasses, an innovation, a technology, and uh, it's a project which is backed and funded by RNIB. And uh, the man behind the project is Dr. Stephen Hicks from Oxford University. And uh, he joins me now. Hello. Hello. How are you going? Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah, we spoke to uh, Dr. Stephen Hicks last year uh, about the project. Tell us about, first of all, what smart, smart glasses are. Well, this is a uh, project that I've been running in my lab for the last four years. And it's a device that is designed to improve the remaining vision that people have, in, in either low vision or partial sightedness. And it, ideally what we're trying to do is make something which looks like a regular pair of glasses. And it picks up three-dimensional objects in the environment and is able to enhance the ones that are the, most, that are the closest to you, the ones that you really need to be able to pick out. So it kind of makes a, a bright object or a bright representation of things that might be an obstacle, like a, you know, a doorway or a table, and then shows that in a way which you, you only need a very small amount of sight to detect. And the idea is really that you're your brain does all the seeing, not so much your eye. And what we want to give people is the, the outlines of things so they can make their own impression about what these objects are and something you can pick up nice and intuitively and, and use. And that's, that's the, been the philosophy for the design of it so far. Have you been surprised the amount of vision that people who, before who are, are registered blind actually still have at the, you know, at the back of their eye? Yeah, I mean, that was my, the, real, uh, the real revelation to me. When, when we started it, we just had a, the, the crudest possible display you could have, like a whole bunch of bright LEDs and just wanted to represent objects as simply as possible. But I, it was, the, the whole process for me was realising how much vision a lot of people have. Obviously, it's, people won't consider it them personally to be a lot, but, um, but for me, the amount of real estate that I have in order to play with, to put images into, it's, it's vast. And we can do, the, we've been doing so much stuff in order to increase the resolution and provide more and more visual data. So, for instance, if I, if I was wearing the smart glasses, I'm really looking at an image on the glasses. I'm not really looking at anything outside that, am I? Well, it's a combination of both. We have the flexibility, depending on how much sight the person mm. has, to either just see the object we present or actually use it as what, we, what you call an augmented reality overlay. So that just means that you see the, the natural world, as you would before, and then you see our transparent highlighted view on top. So one of the nice ways to think about it is you can see a person nearby and you'll get like a bright kind of, like an aura that goes around them. And what that does is it helps you demarcate the object. So it increases the contrast of the object that you see and you can detect its boundaries. And that's really what your eye is doing right at the beginning, right at the retinal stage, is you're finding the lines in the environment and that helps your brain later on uh, work out where those boundaries are and separate them kind of conceptually. So we're providing that ability to improve contrast really just based on the, the shape of nearby things. So it's like the ready break could... Yeah, yeah, for the sure. Aura. Well, I think the, the way they really liked it is um, we've had some people who tested it and they go, oh, it's just like the AHA video, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. take on me. And everyone kind of looks at like these sort of dancing cartoons. Mm. And I had to look it back up, you know. Um, You're to too young, out. obviously. <laughs> I had a sister who loved AHA. So. <laughs> what kind of eye conditions then can this help? Uh, well, I think this is still one of our ongoing questions, exactly who, who it's for. Uh, the current one that we use is quite a centrally positioned display and it's, we use some off-the-shelf hardware, which isn't as wide as we actually like. So it's about 20, 25 degrees. So what that, so the, the group that has worked best for absolutely is retinitis pigmentosa. Um, but also looking at glaucoma, and we've had some good responses in terms of improving face recognition with, people, with some people with glaucoma. Uh, diabetic retinopathy is not too bad as well, because you've got some level of sight in the center uh, sometimes. Well, um, was that a surprise to you? Yep, yep. Yeah. Actually, the real surprise to me, and I don't want to overstate this because macular generation is you know, such a big thing for so many people, but uh, we tested some people early on with, with AMD, and uh, if, you, if you've got that central scotoma or the central blind spot which is spreading, you've still got light perception in there. Some people remarked that it felt like it filled in that hole for them because it provided sort of that three-dimensional structure, as I was saying before, about objects, and the brain just kind of stitched it together. I mean, saying that, I've te we've tested people with later stage AMD, and it, there isn't enough vision in the center for the types of displays we've got. So we've got a second project. Well, we continue to, to develop other displays with, which can be better for um, enhancing peripheral vision. Now, last year, it was quite a cumbersome um, setup because you had your laptop yep. and you had these big glasses, and your idea was that you were, uh, and you were quite optimistic that you'd be able to shrink these down to uh, a, a much smaller size. How, how has that gone? Yeah, that's gone really well. So the, you know, we won the, the Google Impact Challenge we put, uh, with RNIB and put a lot of money into uh, taking it from that laptop down into something which can be portable. 
Um, so now we have one which runs uh, on an Android phone. So the operating system is, is battery powered, nice and small. And then where we really put our effort into is the one that I've got here in front of us, which is um, a system which is a bit more like a visor. It's, it's quite comfortable, it's got padding, you can, you can wear it. I'm not gonna say it's the most discreet object in the world, but we have worn them outside and haven't raised too many eyebrows yet. And that's, uh, that's really been the case of working with a, a good design company who have been able to really think about how we can reduce the weight, which parts we don't need, and then just kind of put this into you know, a relatively attractive chassis. May I pick them up? Yeah. Please. They're um, all incredibly light. Yeah, I are ah, right now. So they, they look like basically a pair of sunglasses, but with a, a visor round, round the outside of them, which slips around the side of the head, strap on the back, and uh, there's some little... I, protect, I take it those are yep. sensors on the front for picking yep. up the, the images. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so that, that's a lot lighter. What about the, the battery life then? How, how does that last? Uh, so we we actually use like off-the-shelf ba you know, batteries from Amazon that we can you know, use to recharge your mobile phone. Um, the current one we have is lasts somewhere between six and seven hours. So really? Yeah, I mean, we, we it is, it's a relatively large pack that you sort of have to carry on your shoulder for that. But we we really want to give people the, the chance, at least our testing participants who go through it, the chance to use it for the majority of a day before they have to recharge. It's going to take all night to recharge a battery of that scale. But if you use a mobile phone, and this is one of the things that everyone struggles with when it comes to wearables. You know, Google Glass had a very short battery life because it had a tiny battery you know, packed into it. Is that you can get sort of 30 minutes of useful time out of it if you don't mind having just a tiny battery in your pocket. But I kind of, the way I've always considered this is, is you, you use it, you get out of the house, it, it gets you to the shops or gets you to work. When you're there, you do whatever you like to do and then you need it to come back again. So you need like four hours at least. Uh, we'll find that out when we do our testing, actually how much people need it and, that's, um, and that will let us know what kind of battery we need in the future. Can you actually see in the dark with these as well then? Perfect. In fact, they're absolutely the best in the dark. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the camera that you mentioned at the top here is actually, it's an infrared, well, it, one part of it is an infrared camera. So it sends out a projection of all these tiny lasered infrared points. It's actually just based on the Kinect, like a games camera from the past. And so it uses its own light source. So it illuminates the area and you can detect the three-dimensional structures in, within it and then we represent that on the display. Where this one doesn't work, uh, or at least that particular feature of it, is in actually bright sunlight. So um, you're not able to, the camera isn't able to detect enough of, the, of these tiny points in order to register the image. So we have another type of enhancement that we can do there, which just kind of improves contrast on, in general. Where would you see this going now? Do, do you want to shrink these even further? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is the, the test version, really. You know, if it's, it's relatively low cost, so we could, we could make that if people wanted it, if, if it turns out to be the right sort of shape. But no, already I've got, um, I've got our design team. We're all, we've got all the parts together for the new version which has a much a, a wider, a much more low profile display, a smaller camera, and, um, and a much better processor. So one of the limitations we have is these processors are kind of relatively old. You can't do as much interesting stuff with the display as you'd like. Um, so the new one we've got can, you know, can map the world in 3D. We can send some of that data back to our servers to do uh, what we'd call object detection, or even I'm really looking a lot at now text recognition. So what you, OCR, what you call character recognition, able to extract information from the environment and present that either as an audio description of the text or on the screen, if that's feasible. All those things are kind of in the pipeline for the next version we're making. Now, I know last year you were very excited about this. You find that you, you get more excited as you go, yeah. you see the possibilities. Yeah, I, think, I think so, I'm listening to myself talk right now. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I do get, yeah, I get really excited about it. I, it's, I've always loved developing technology and it's an area that, I think when I started this, we were thinking we have to make our own cameras, our own displays and all this kind of stuff. But the way the field is going, you know, the, um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff in terms of virtual reality and um, uh, different types of cameras that people want to put into mobile phones and laptops and things. So I just get to go to trade shows and find the next stuff, and it's like, yeah, can I have one of those? And then, you know, you get an early development version. It keeps the cost down, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, indeed. If we were going to have to make all those parts ourselves, then I don't know where we'd recover the cost. I guess we'd just have to be, uh, you know, just get grants from, from now on. But you can get each of, the, each of those components for around about $100. And that means that there's a, there's a great chance of being able to scale it up. Also, we're not, we're not beholden to any particular technology. So as long as you've got, an, a, you've got a, a camera and a display and some kind of processing unit, we can potentially port our software onto anything. So, there's, so we're actually running a separate project at the moment looking at just using a straight mobile phone and a couple of ways in which you can make that into a viewing platform. Just, just a re experiment to see if we can get away with actually selling no hardware you know, to people who've already got a, a, a high-end mobile phone. Maybe that's good enough for you to be able to detect faces, detect text, and make that enhance. I'm not saying that's 
ready to go or anything, but there's a whole, a whole lot of platforms you can explore for this type of work. And it's lovely because a lot of times you hear about these technologies and it's five years down the line, this will be happening, and five years down the line. And mm. sometimes you, you get a bit despondent if you're, you're partially sighted or you're blind because you think this will never happen. Whereas this really seems to be happening quicker than you even thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, a couple of years ago when they were saying, oh, when's going to be available? And I just kind of, ah, oh, yeah, 2016. And actually, um, I think with the impact challenge and with uh, working with people like Neil Heslop from Solutions at RNIB, we're really focused in order to make this something which is available in, in some form in 2016. Uh, we're forming a company around the idea and it's, and yeah, we're really pushing to get something into people's hands next year. And, that, and this is just the first of many, you know, we'll, we'll make several versions of this over the coming years. And I have no doubt that other people will make you know, equivalent technologies Currently, they are the ones that you can buy, not ours, but ones that you can get, like augmenting systems, are quite expensive. But I think that's because the companies themselves made all those parts from scratch. But because we're following on companies like Epson, who already make quite interesting displays, that cost is, you know, all the engineering is already done. So it's just a case really piecing these jigsaw puzzles together and seeing what's the best system you can make this year, and then you, you look at it again next year and next year. and They'll get cheaper and smaller over the, over the next five years. And last year you were talking about you were hoping to get to the stage where you'd be able to put some pairs out and let people use them for a little while, get feedback, bring them back, and then other people could use them. Have you started that? Yeah, we have. So this is one of the first uh, four units that we made several months ago. Um, and with the RNIB, we're doing the, the screening process for, that, for that, um, those tests at the moment. There are some 370 people who are recruited, um, and we're w looking at who has the... Well, who has the, I guess, the most appropriate level of sight for the visor or the glasses at this stage. And then back at our lab, we've got all the parts for the next uh, 30, which we're putting together over, the, uh, over actually the next two weeks. And that will be the first take-home units that people will start to look at. And that, that study runs from as soon as we get them into people's hands, hopefully end of September, up until uh, April when that, when that part finishes. And after that, actually, there'll be, hopefully, a whole bunch of glasses that still work, which we can then do internal testing, um, or loan them out to other um, sight loss groups around the country who want to be able to explore it. And they, they seem very light, uh, really. I mean, there's a bit of weight in them, but they're mm. not too bad. You mentioned cost. What sort of price do you think you'll be able to, to get these out to people for? This is still it's still, mm. <laughs> it's still an ongoing ongoing question. I mean, we've we've always with the RNIB, we've always had a, like a, a the cost of a kind of a high end smartphone has been generally the, the target price. Um, and I think we can. I think we can do that. This one here, because they're all handmade. You know, they they, <laughs> they cost more than that to make. You know, but that's because you know, we're, we're slow and expensive. Um, yeah, it really comes down to scale. So one thing we're going to learn out of this testing that we're doing is how many people actually are appropriate for it. The where the where we where we're doing our testing, when we kind of sample randomly through um, the registered blind community, we look at about 30% of people that seem to have a, a positive response to that which if you know the numbers and the global blindness, that's actually a, it's a pretty significant number to work with. If that, if that turns out to be true, then you know, uh, that's, a, that's a really good market. We can, we can scale that up and, and bring the cost down. And the thing is, you can wear them and kid on your superhero, a special power. <laughs> sort of well, I always think that's a great thing. You <laughs> know, it's the, rather than having technologies which you have to kind of, as, a, as an afterthought, put on some kind of accessibility, you start with that. Start with this. This is something which is, I mean, I, I really want to make this into a desirable object mm. and something which, which looks good and, yeah, provides you with absolute vision in, in darkness. You know, it even has like a little red laser coming out the front. I mean, that's got to oh, be cool. <laughs> on, on a foggy day, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Isn't that going to put the fear of God in the people? <laughs> so, where can we? get more information then to find out just about how things are going? Well, we've got a website. Uh, we've, the website's called VAST, which is va-st.com. Uh, we were originally going to call ourselves Visual Alchemy. I'm not sure if that's the case anymore because <laughs> everyone said it sounds like a 70s rock band. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, of course it does. Uh, but yeah, if you go to va-st.com, that'll give you um, outline about the, the products and also some of the other work we're doing. So we're looking at other ways of, um, of encoding the world. There's a a project I've just, just completed a pilot for that tries to map the world in an auditory in way. And people have done similar stuff before, but my, my effort was trying to make something that's going to be actually pleasant to listen to. And we've had really nice, really nice pilot data from that. So, so if you go to that website, you'll be able to find out a bit more about this, this particular project and then also upcoming ones as well. The world is your oyster. <laughs> yes, it's a lovely place. I love oysters. Dr. Stephen Hicks from Oxford University, thank you very much for joining us on Insight Radio. Thank you very much.